May I come in, sir? Yes, come in. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you, sir. Are you vaccinated? Yes, sir. We are also vaccinated. You can remove your mask so that we can have a mean, meaningful interaction. Thank you, sir. Uh, introduce yourself to the board, highlighting your educational qualification and experience. Uh, my name is Syed Mustafa Hashmi. I'm a surgeon. I've had my undergraduate and postgraduate uh, education at Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad. Uh, my father is a civil engineer. Uh, my mother is MSc B.A. but she's a homemaker. I have three younger siblings, all of whom are into medicine, sir. Mustafa, should I call you Mustafa? Yes, sir. Mustafa, that you are a qualified doctor, you did your graduation, you did your post-graduation, you are an MS, if I'm not mistaken. Society needs you. Such bright doctors is needed in society. Why do you want to waste your talent by joining the civil services and not to continue uh, with your professional uh, uh, this thing? Sir, I believe I'm putting my talent to best possible use by joining the civil services, sir. Uh, there is also a personal reason to this, sir. Uh, one of my earliest memories in life, when I was, I think, just four or five years old, is my grandfather, uh, who was a government employee, telling me that uh, an IS officer is a dream job and he wants me to become one. That remained as a seed for a long while till I joined uh, my medicine. And through the end of my medicine, sir, during my internship, when I actually interacted with patients and in my surgical training, some of my most satisfying moments were uh, when I operate a patient and there's a huge smile on the face. But sir, this very smile, I saw it vanishing when the patients get discharged. On speaking to people uh, over and over again on this, I realized that health is only one of the many deprivations that people face, sir. And I believe civil services offers me that opportunity uh, to make a lasting, more deeper impact and that is where I find my real calling to be, sir. But you see, uh, of course, you, have, you are very much passionate about joining the civil services. But of late, civil services has come for a lot of criticism for all the wrong reasons. And there is general perception that reforming Indian bureaucracy is a mission impossible. This is the perception, public perception. Still, you are so passionate about joining the service and be an agent of change. Is it possible? Sir, I believe a public perception is not the metric to judge uh, any aspect, sir, because public perception can be far removed from what the reality is, sir. And I believe even in the 21st century, uh, Sardar Patel's uh, evocative phrase of calling the bureaucracy the steel frame still holds good, sir. And the way I see it, sir, uh, a group of 6,000 odd IS officers catering to 1.3 billion population. And if I include all civil services, perhaps it is upwards of 10 or so lakhs of employees catering to the most populous soon to be country in the world. I believe that is a huge opportunity uh, for not just leadership, but also creativity, innovation which is needed to perhaps combat that perception, sir. When you say that uh, 6,000 or 7,000 odd IS officers are serving a huge country like India with a population of 1.2 or 4 billion, and you are happy with this, then why the government is contemplating, toying with the idea or even implementing the lateral entry in the higher equivalence of administration in the country at the level of the joint secretary, at the level of director, why there is a need for inducting people from the private sector when the government servants, IS officers are doing so exceedingly well? Sir, fundamentally, I believe that uh, we have a 19th century bureau bureaucratic structure addressing 21st century challenges, sir, and this is bound to create some mismatch. Sir. And uh, we have incredible talent in the private sector as well, sir, which can be utilized for the country's upliftment, be it econ uh, economically, socially, especially in, in the health sector as well. Some of the best entrepreneurs we have are in the health sector. As a doctor, I've seen the results that they can give, sir. So I believe lateral entry is a portal towards the same goal that the bureaucracy has, that is uh, increasing the efficiency of governance, sir. So this gets in talent, which raises the overall standard of our services. But don't you think there's a dichotomy or an irony in your statement? On the one hand, you said that Indian bureaucracy is a steel frame. It is not amenable to change. Politicians may come, may go. Political masters may come, may go. But 
the bureaucrats will remain neutral. On the other hand, you are talking of 19th century rules, 21st century and all that, and then bringing in fresh talent from the private sector, it uh, is not very convincing argument. Sir, uh, the steel frame, steel itself is quite malleable, sir. By melting steel, we can create a newer frame to address newer challenges, sir. So I believe uh, the institution of bureaucracy in principle is something indispensable to any democratic governance structure, uh, structure sir. Uh, it is important to map the needs to the uh, talent we have, sir. And on this front, both our recruitment process and also the lateral entry serves this very purpose of increasing the overall efficiency, sir. Theoretically, it sounds so well, so good. But imagine a person, a career bureaucrat, who has joined the service at the young age of 25, 26, 27. After serving the country for a long period of two decades, suddenly he finds a, fre a new man coming on a wild card and joining the service on a contract basis. How will he feel about it? What will happen to his self-estimation? Self-esteem, sorry. Sir, as a bureaucrat, we place national needs above uh, our self-esteem, sir. So I believe uh, uh, he, any person in that position should be seeing it in a positive light because every individual is working towards betterment of, say, the country's uh, service delivery as a whole. And any addition to that, come at whatever cost, it should be good, sir. In this context, uh, I believe that uh, a civil servant uh, is not there for his personal gain or uh, ra raising his own stature or authority, sir. Uh, if that is so, if that this is what a civil servant thinks, I believe he's misplaced in the job, sir. That's your, what you personally feel. That's good. Okay. Imagine a scenario where instead of politicians getting elected by the people, they are also selected through a method like UPSC, and the country is run in the on the corporate lines, and the prime minister of the country works like a CEO of a company, then what happens to the country? Sir, uh, the idea of a meritocracy, which is what uh, the idea is essentially uh, you're suggesting as, is sound in theory, sir. But in practice, at independence, uh, it was a conscious decision by the constitution makers that given our diversity of our populace, the only solution is democracy, sir, where one person has one vote, and only that can ensure adequate representation and uh, addressing each group's or each individual's concerns. Sir. So I believe uh, while it sounds uh, very promising to have an, a selection process, the qualities that are needed in a political leader or uh, in a smart governing authority are not those that can be qualified in numbers. Sir. So I believe the people can make a conscious choice based on those human aspects of a person, those uh, individual qualities and talents, which perhaps cannot be quantified, sir. Imagine another scenario, a related question I'm asking you. IS post is a journalist post. Anybody studying history, geography, Sanskrit, Urdu comes into the IES. And it's not very baffling that a man of Hindi literature, he, he, is, he becomes secretary of health and he issues instructions on uh, Medicare for the entire country. Similarly, a student of geography, he takes over technical education and starts giving instructions on uh, to how our technical education system should be. Is it not uh, incorrect? Sir, I believe uh, to have a talented person in policy formulation requires ground experience, sir. And anyone reaching the post of any undersecretary or higher ups is somebody who has got plethora of experience on the field, sir. And it is that experience that translates to good policy regardless of their educational background, sir. I believe uh, maybe the health secretary uh, in the hypothetical scenario who has Hindi literature benefits from the idioms of Hindi, but he thinks in uh, public service delivery terms because of its experience, sir. And I believe there is no contradiction in this. Okay, thank you very much. Mustafa, how are you feeling? Very good, sir. Let's continue the discussion. You're coming uh, from Hyderabad, and you mentioned Urdu as your mother tongue, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and um, you are in Delhi, another uh, wonderful place for Urdu. Can you just compare uh, for us uh, the Urdu of Hyderabad with Urdu of uh, Delhi? Sir, the register of uh, Urdu or the dialect spoken in Telangana, where I belong, is called Dakani, sir. And it has its own peculiarities, its own colloquialisms, pronunciations, 
uh, it is found to be very colorful to listeners of uh, other regions whereas the urdu spoken in delhi sir has greater influence of uh, avadhi and the hindi registers so there is a difference in uh, intonation as well and also in the way sentences are formed and in the street language itself sir uh, so you believe that uh, um, uh, hyderabadi urdu is more colorful can you just uh, tell me what kind of colors are these sir i believe there is a tinge of informality and uh, a very welcoming scent that is perceived by a listener in terms of uh, creating an easy friendship in the easy go lingo that hyderabad uses sir anyway let's go a little serious you are practicing doctor in the sense that you have masters as well as gra- graduation in medicine and you have published certain papers also yes sir i have been practicing surgery uh, and also working for what covid primarily your papers are on research uh, papers yes sir in the field of surgery sir published two mainly papers. the reporting things or more than that just the reporting of few medical cases or it's more than that no sir these are innovations in surgical techniques that i have uh, done two papers on sir uh, one of them was uh, on the surgery for anal fissures sir uh, we have done that surgery in local anesthesia instead of spinal anesthesia sir which is a distinct advantage for <laughs> several reasons the second paper was on making the incision in abdominal surgery sir T- typically a scalpel is used uh, but we also have an instrument called the electrocautery which uses the electric current to make the incision sir and i've compared both these methods and found them to be equally effective sir i can uh, uh, clearly see the passion you uh, you you uh, using while uh, discussing uh, these things but uh, do you believe that covid time was really a bad time for anybody who's uh, really serious about medical publications and medical inquiry uh, the way almost everybody was claiming to have a, either a cure or uh, some kind of a effective medicine or um, something to prevent uh, covid Uh, purely in terms of uh, medical publications and medical inquiry do you believe that uh, the damage done in the past 2 years is something uh, which will take long uh, to recover sir i would take a diametrically opposite position to the, that notion sir because covid has called caused a landmark shift in medical research publishing earlier a lot of research in fact most of the top rated journals were behind the paywall sir so a person like me had to subscribe paying a hefty fee what covid did was the moment this became a public health emergency of international concern all journals across the board made their papers free for all so i was able to access the latest research across several journals up to date so as and when i was going and i could tailor my treatments to my patients so i believe medical research has gained a lot because of covid sir if we stay again at the at the same uh, the reporting and the academics of uh, medical thing do you believe that uh, the ayush and the entire ayush uh, family uh, they suffer primarily because they don't have a supporting ecosystem in terms of medical sciences uh, uh, reporting as well as academics uh, there are no ways of uh, actually uh, peer reviewed or other papers getting published and uh, getting uh, the acceptance from the medical fraternity uh, they they may have merit uh, in their uh, treatments or um, reporting sometime but uh, since there is no ecosystem therefore will keep suffering is that true sir uh, i believe there is a vibrant uh, research output also from ios in the past decade or so sir in terms of randomized control trials being published from institutes that are into ios sir at the same time sir because i know the concerns of the medical community of modern medicines or of allopathic medicine as it is called i believe uh, my opinion is there is medicine that works there is medicine that doesn't sir and uh, if i were to take the example of the very first drug to treat hypertension that came from sarpagandha which is an ayurvedic drug uh, the most important drug to treat malaria today artemether comes from chinese traditional medicine sir so i believe there is a lot of scope for this kind of research to develop further which it already uh, is undergoing sir okay let's move to uh, your home state uh, telangana do you believe that the formation of telangana state uh, obviously now it's a historical fact that it is created uh, but uh, hyderabad Uh, which was nurtured and kind of uh, made by uh, Andhra Pradesh as uh, a lot of resources, both human resources and obviously the monetary resources went into it. Uh, uh, Hyderabad, uh, I mean, the, the Andhra Pradesh got a uh, raw deal in this whole uh, thing. Don't you think so? And there must be a little Telugu in you still. There is very much a part of Telugu in me because Telangana is a Telugu state, sir. Uh, sir, on the question of Hyderabad, no doubt it was the crown jewel of erstwhile Andhra Pradesh, sir. 
which is why the reorganization act provided for a common capital for 10 years uh, andhra pradesh has taken decision to have its own capital sooner than that but uh, hyderabad was a sore point uh, in division sir but if i trace it historically sir there was grievance from telangana localites as well that a lot of political economic and social positions in hyderabad were taken by rich uh, people from the coastal andhra side sir so earlier in the 1950s and 60s there were mulki rules uh, where uh, reservation or uh, 12 year uh, domicile was necessary for availing government jobs sir but this rule was done away with which favored people migrating into hyderabad sir so i believe there was a valid resentment by the locals uh, because they couldn't get uh, jobs and uh, set up businesses or also in the telugu film industry have their own footprint to the extent that they would want in their own place sir so uh, uh, the bifurcation on the whole in the seven years has been a win win for both states sir okay uh, mustafa uh, what is the status of uh, the census that was supposed to happen what exactly is this current status i'm not very clear exactly when sir but one of these months uh, the enumeration phase was supposed to start sir whose responsibility is uh, the census uh, as far as our country is concerned sir in our constitutional scheme it is the registrar general of uh, census of india Uh, under the central uh, government who do we have a constitutional backing to census is it a executive exercise legislative exercise what is it so we have a census act of 1948 sir so it is a legislative uh, aspect sir there is also constitutional backing to the census sir uh, in the context of sc st enumeration sir and having uh, data backing reservations sir in articles 340s in and later that brings sir. me to, uh, to the actual question i uh, i was building for we we have been having this scst census since uh, long it never created any problem then why now having a caste census uh, so that the enumeration of uh, obcs uh, can be done uh, is such a um, touchy affair for uh, the um, government of the day so there are both historical and uh, current reasons for it being a touchy affair sir primarily is of course the political angle where uh, any caste enumeration changes the equations that political parties have to cater to sir but uh, what i find more important is that uh, when the census itself can have columns for sc and st uh, it can also have a column for obc the current problem is the scct exercise which was supposed to tackle this very aspect resulted in i believe around 46 lakh castes sir because of spelling variations or uh, geographic diversities sir uh, so that has left a dilemma in the minds of uh, the executive that will such an exercise done again not lead to similar uh, pitfalls sir so i believe uh, the government is taking a very careful stance on this and uh, while the merits of the exercise are not in question it is the execution that becomes tricky sir how such a committee uh, was able to uh, do it, uh, this thing uh, as far as minorities are concerned where they got data from sir uh, from what i can recall sir uh, just uh, such a committee uh, visited all states in the country and got data from state governments sir which effectively means that sta- state governments do have data that's uh, that's a claim uh, no state government have made so far in fact uh, states like bihar have um, pitched for uh, caste census sir i believe the crux here lies in the fact that census is included in the union list sir which uh, does not allow states the room to conduct it on their own sir fine thank you when did you complete your mbbs in 2016 ma'am 2016 and since you have been working and uh, uh, be in the field na no? Do you uh, feel there are any lacunas in the curriculum which is existing for MBBS graduate uh, graduate students? Any yes, lacuna ma'am. areas? Yeah. When I studied, uh, uh, we were following a very hierarchical structure, which is not in tune with what most other countries follow, ma'am, which is the PBL framework, problem-based learning. At the same time, ma'am, my youngest sibling, when he joined uh, about three years ago, uh, the National Medical Commission came up with what is called the competency-based curriculum. which brings into effect the very changes that i missed in my education ma'am that is a focus on ethics on communication on biostatistics so these are areas i believe uh, they have been included included na? right okay recently in, uh, some new recommendations were suggested are you aware of them ma'am uh, on the medical 
curriculum front, I'm not particularly able to recall anything, but uh, of late there have been calls for having the Charakasha Pad instead of the Hippocratic Oath Map. So there were some other suggestions in the same recommendations as well, which included one of them was including integrative medicine into the curriculum. So what are your views about it? Ma'am, what I realized when I was doing my internship after uh, four and a half years of a more theoretical bent of mine, I realized that there is a difference between what we read in the classes and what we see in the hospital when we deal, deal with patients, ma'am. And an integrated curriculum can bridge this gap, not in just this manner, but also in the fact that uh, social aspects of health, when we speak to a patient from, a different back, from different backgrounds, how do we address their concerns? How do we gain their trust? No, no, no. I'm asking something else. Integrative medicine, what do you understand by this concept? There are two or three different strands that come to my mind, ma'am. They're not two or three different. It's, it's, it's a very specific term. I'm not very sure of the exact meaning, ma'am. Okay. It's like uh, integrating of all the forms of medicines, like Ayurveda, Yunani, which are prevalent in India, kind of making, uh, bringing them together. So do you support the idea? Yes, ma'am. That reminds me of the fact that uh, it was suggested to include Ayush as an optional subject for medical undergraduates. And ma'am, I personally feel I would have benefited with that. So I'm, I believe it's a good idea, ma'am. Do you prescribe anything or when you are interacting with your patients, do you include any of this uh, streams in your prescription or discussion? Ma'am, even if I don't, it is the patients who bring it up often, ma'am. In terms of... Uh, if I use, use colloquial terms, uh, garam khana, thanda khana, which is a concept in Yunani medicine that patients often ask me, should I eat this or shouldn't I eat that? So in a way, I have to tackle with these questions. And if I have the requisite theoretical background, I'll be able to better address their concerns, ma'am. Okay. So uh, you have been researching in the field of uh, surgery, you, as you mentioned. I feel the cost, cost is the major factor which na, limits the use or uh, the reach of surgeries to normal patients of India. Do you agree with it? Yes, ma'am. There is some truth to, to that claim. Uh, but what I would be more interested in is to break down the costs and see uh, which areas are actually uh, drawing out more of the expenses, ma'am. Uh, it is not the surgeon's fee. I'll leave that out first, ma'am. Uh, it is the allied hospital costs of hospital stay, of drugs, of equipment, and of hospital maintenance that drive up the bills, ma'am. And this makes it uh, unaffordable for the lower socioeconomic status to afford tertiary care and good private hospitals, ma'am. Uh, but then government hospitals where I worked provide the same services for free and the surgical results in government hospitals are no less uh, inferior. So here comes the area of regulation of the private hospitals. Who, who regulates them? Uh, ma'am, it is uh, now the National Medical Commission under which... Uh, National Medical Commission? What do, what, Formerly what the is? MCI, ma'am. Now it's the National Medical Commission. What, what's its mandate? It's, it has a very bad mandate catering from both medical education to uh, clinical practice itself, ma'am. Okay, but how are the pricing regulated? I don't think National Medication, Medical Commission has anything to do with the pricing. On the pricing front, ma'am, uh, Niti Aayog had come up with a model Clinical Establishment Act, which uh, a few states tried to implement, particularly Maharashtra, ma'am. What this, this did was create a range or slab rates for several surgeries so that even the private sector has room for making its own adjustments. At the same time, people don't feel they're fleeced, ma'am. So I believe a clinical establishment act is a way forward at the state level to cater to their needs, ma'am. Okay. And you were a COVID warrior during the pandemic? Yes, ma'am. So can you elaborate the five lacuna areas which were most glaring in the uh, field of health, health sector in general, not only medicine, but sector as a whole. In the health sector as a whole, ma'am, what COVID, uh, the lacunae it showed India, uh, the very first one I would point out is our inverted set of priorities, ma'am. While about 50% of the disease burden is in primary care, a lot of funding goes to tertiary care, ma'am. Uh, so that is point okay, number one. Okay, that was one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, secondly, there was a shortage of not just doctors, but also allied healthcare staff, which was ignored. Patient care workers, uh, nurses, operation theater technicians, these are people that we often... Okay, trained professionals. Yes, ma'am. Third? Paramedics. Thirdly, ma'am, uh, rural penetration of our services, ma'am. Our The best of our healthcare services are concentrated in uh, urban and semi-urban areas. So I believe the rural areas were underserved 
compared to their needs, ma'am. Okay, fourth. Yes, ma'am, uh, fourthly, our ability to manufacture our own drugs from the raw material itself. We were source dependent on a neighboring country for a lot of our active pharmaceutical ingredients, ma'am. Neighboring so, country? China in particular, ma'am. Okay. And lastly, ma'am, what I find close to my heart is the kind of funding we have for research and development, which is, I believe, just 0.65%. Whereas other developing developed countries spends uh, about three or four percent, ma'am. Okay. And um, what do you think is the insurance, health insurance uh, penetration percentage of India, Indian population in? Ma'am, I'm not exactly aware of the percentage, ma'am, but uh, it is in low double digits, ma'am. Low double digits. Mm, I don't think that's the case. Ayushman Bharat scheme. How 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 much of population it covers? It covers about. Uh, 80 crore, two thirds of the two thirds of the population, ma'am. No, that's also not correct. But no problem. Uh, can you tell me one more last thing? Uh, how do we, we define maternal death, ma'am? Any death uh, occurring from the onset of a viable pregnancy to the onset uh, to the postpartum period is a maternal death, ma'am. Postpartum period. How how far? Uh, seven it days is? postpartum. Only. Perinatal uh, maternal mortality is still seven days, ma'am. Otherwise. Maternal mortality broadly is 42 days, ma'am. Okay. So, what are the three main reasons, top contributors to the maternal death? High risk pregnancies, ma'am, okay. uh, is a broad term that covers a lot of uh, contributing factors like anemia, early pregnancies, younger age groups, ma'am. Uh, secondly, ma'am, lack of access to healthcare in the rural areas, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thirdly, uh, I would rate. Uh, you would read. I'm asking what is what are the three contributors to it? I'm recalling from my personal experiences, ma'am. Uh, on a broad level, it is maternal factors, fetal factors, and social factors, ma'am. Postpartum hemorrhage. Is the number one cause of uh, maternal mortality, ma'am. Okay, and then second to uh, second would be? Perpural sepsis, ma'am, would be one among the top five, at least for sure. Okay, and what about eclampsia and preeclampsia? These are risk factors for maternal mortality ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mustafa, uh, so you have been COVID warrior. You must have known that during pandemic, uh, there were too many drugs being prescribed by doctors, doctors themselves, which later came into controversy, like ivermectin was being prescribed and it's essentially a veterinary drug. Mostly it's used on animals. And uh, then uh, there was this case of hydrochloroquinone, which was being taken by doctors themselves as preventive uh, measure for some time. And then it was taken off the list. And it being in combination sometimes with Azi. So what exactly was happening? I mean, uh, did doctors forget the whole pharma? What was happening? Ma'am, COVID was a completely new disease. So even the medical community was uh, finding its way in uncharted territories, ma'am. And there is trial and error involved in finding the appropriate treatments, ma'am. Because for a novel disease, we cannot have a novel drug. We have to see what current drugs work but because then, they are tested, uh, As doctors, we also need to see that if we are uh, giving any combination of drugs which can have adverse drug reactions, and uh, when doctor themsel doctors themselves started prescribing certain drugs, uh, people were going to the uh, you know chemists and asking for those very drugs, even without the prescription. Don't you think doctors had some responsibility in this regard? The line of uh, treatment they were issuing? Ma'am, I believe the problem is twofold, ma'am. At a higher level, uh, the standard setting bodies also differed in the treatment itself. WHO had a different list of recommended drugs. ICMR had chloroquine on its list, which the WHO did, did not have, for instance, ma'am. Uh, so at least in the first couple of months, we were trial, uh, trying to find out the best treatment combination through, tri through, through trial and error and clinical research, ma'am. The second problem is uh, evidence-based medicine, which is the current medical era we are in, has not penetrated enough in terms of the practice that doctors follow in their uh, clinical domains, ma'am. Uh, by and large, I believe most doctors whom I converse with try to stay updated with the recommendations, but uh, over time some stagnation does set in and which is why we have a concept of CMEs or continuing medical education for even established doctors, ma'am. Okay. You have uh, been interested in climate change, as I can see from your uh, uh, DAF. So, uh, recently, climate change issue was taken up till uh, UNSC, uh, the Security Council of United Nations. 
despite having a UNFCCC, which is the go-to body for such uh, talks, why did this topic was being discussed in Security Council, where only a handful of countries have uh, superior powers and uh, they being the biggest polluters, they were deciding on matters of climate change. Ma'am, uh, in fact, India itself opposed the involvement of climate change on the UN Security Council's agenda for this very reason, that there's a dedicated body to deal with it, to club it with uh, other uh, important uh, aspects, dilutes both these domains, security and climate change, ma'am. Uh, I believe uh, certain countries uh, who stand to benefit economically through the needs for climate change and the new investments and the industrial innovations and technology transfers, uh, they stand to benefit by raising this issue at all possible for us. So I believe it was in their interest that they did it, ma'am. Uh, we just had our COP26 at Glasgow. Uh, can you tell me some of the pledges that were being taken there? Ma'am, uh, India committed to Panchamprit its five goals that it would want to reach by 2030 and by 2070, ma'am carbon neutrality by 2070, uh, reducing or sucking up 1 billion tons of carbon stock by 2030, increasing our non-fossil fuel. What were fuel. the four main pledges that were taken unanimously? One was uh, for phasing out of coal, phasing down of coal, ma'am. It was later corrected to phasing down of coal. There was a global methane pledge, ma'am, that was taken by a lot of countries. Uh, the One World, One Sun, One Grid initiative was also an important initiative, ma'am and then individual countries revise their nationally determined contributions, ma'am. We recently had this new criminal procedure code uh, bill in uh, our parliament and there was a lot of furor over it. As doctor, can you tell me, uh, is it a good, is this bill good in spirit when it comes to the biological data storing of that part of data? even for prisoners, even for criminals? Is it in good sense, in good spirit? There are two ways to see this problem, ma'am. From a purely medical or a scientific perspective, having biological data adds another punch to security apparatus, ma'am. It gives greater certainty in tracking and in identifying uh, criminals, ma'am. On the other hand, the clause on preventive detainees also having their biological samples collected, I believe, uh, encroaches on the right to privacy under, art under Article 21, ma'am. So these are two broad concerns that have to be balanced by the so even body, you have your reservations with respect to the bill? Yes, ma'am. It requires a strong pre-legislative and uh, legislative impact assessment, ma'am, for a healthy functioning bill. Ma okay. My last question to you. This is this one is just out of curiosity. Why coats are white while drapes and scrubs are green? Ma'am, the reason why coats are white. In fact, uh, they were beige color in the 19th century. They slowly became white because white symbolized purity, truthfulness and it conveyed uh, a psychological uh, sense of uh, purity to the patient, ma'am. Whereas for surgical drapes, uh, the color contrast becomes very important, ma'am. When we operate, uh, blood spills over, and the contrast, it's a complementary color. Green or blue is complementary to red. So that does not distort your visual field much, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yes, doctor, do we have provision related to preventive retention mentioned in Indian constitution? Sir, uh, Article 22 speaks of the rights for a preventive detainee, sir. Excuse me, does it deal with rights or it actually provides for preventive retention as well? It does specify a timeline, right, within which the advisory board will have to be constituted. Yes, sir. Now, my question is, Article 22, under which part of the constitution it is mentioned? This is under Part 3, sir. Excellent. What in the world is a provision related to preventive retention doing in a chapter which is so-called holy grail of our constitution, which is part 3. Don't you think it is antithetical? Sir, this concern has been raised for a long time, sir. Uh, and I believe the reason why this is so is uh, we have adapted a lot of prov the provisions from the Government of India Act 1935, sir. So I believe it is a legacy that it remains. Have pre provision related to preventive retention, but for God's sake, why under part 3? And that too, why under Article 22? Have it outside the realm of Part 3. Nobody is stopping you, but you are actually constitutionally mandating preventive retention under the most sacrosanct part of our constitution, which is, if I have to put it mildly, baffling. Anyways, uh, let's say there is a patient, Dr. Saab. He comes to you. He says, Bhai Saab, 
my hb1ac is 11.5 my fasting sugar is 200 my non fasting sugar which i will actually measure 2 hours after consuming of meal is 240 would you actually recommend metformin to him sir i would like to first assess his medical history sir has he already been taking medication no he is not taking any medicine sir as a new patient with these values i would start him on metformin just hang in there metformin i show because metformin is renally cleared and once when you have diabetes for god knows x number of days the first organ which perhaps takes a lot of hit is kidneys now comes the next question aren't you astounded with the fact that most of the renal or rather most of the diabetic medicines are renally cleared whereas there are tons of antibiotics which are not renally cleared so you are basically feeding medicines in order to ensure that he is in the operation table possibly 2 to 3 years uh, sir i beg to differ here sir uh, because that would be a very uncharitable reading of the situation correct antibiotics were discovered and they are still being researched upon since the 1920s let's focus on metformin and it's all all its sister medicines being renally cleared you're talking of a patient who is diabetic and whose kidneys are failing as i talk sir as i recall there are about 10 or 12 different classes of drugs that treat diabetes sir of these only about half or so are renally, renally cleared sir right not all of them sir and metformin is perhaps one of the most important drugs to treat diabetes sir uh i was about to mention the fact that for this patient i would order a profile a diabetic profile which includes renal, renal function test which gives me an assessment of how far his kidneys have been affected sir would you all also order a gfr test to be done as well yes sir uh, naturally yes sir is there a correlation between gfr let's say failing or falling gfr and creatinine yes sir there is so lower your gfr for sure medically you can say that you will definitely have a higher creatinine in your body there could be very rare exceptions sir but broadly that is the principle sir that is the principle lower the gfr higher the creatinine all right going further it's very intriguing to me that heart can develop cancer in the form of a tumor but it's it looks like it that it's a bulletproof organ when it comes to tuberculosis why is it so the incidence of uh, cancers in the heart is very less. very le- very less sir arithmetically negligible i'm aware of that thank you but about tuberculosis the tuberculosis bacilli uh, they lodge in the apex of the lung where there is both ventilation why and perfusion why are we presuming sir? that tuberculosis only has to do with pulmonary i mean i i i fail to understand that so i was about to extend that argument the biggest burden of tuberculosis is pulmonary tuberculosis sir there are extra pulmonary tuberculosis as well it affects the brain as well and liver and all other organs in the body sir uh, on the question of why it doesn't affect the heart sir uh, i don't know the exact reasons for it but then I let's would... stop there because rest it's all conjecture jargons right but nonetheless a scary uh, read i was actually going through some article day before yesterday uh, in the context of shane wan's death right a famous cricketer leg spinner they say that uh, sleep apnea if it's prolonged can almost certainly cause heart attack do you agree with that hypothesis yes sir and why do you agree with those, with that hypothesis so what sleep apnea does it it creates creates an oxygen hunger in the body correct because of uh, cessation of uh, the breathing process the body is starved of oxygen sir and the very first organ to be affected because of that is the heart because it drains about 20% of the body's oxygen supply sir right so there is a direct correlation between prolonged sleep apnea periods and a myocardial infarction sir. all right doctor what is the difference between headline inflation and core inflation and if you were to be our rbi governor which figures would you first focus on so uh, core inflation is the inflation rate uh, of the basket of goods minus fuel and food sir which see a more frequent fluctuation sir uh, headline inflation is the overall inflation in the economy sir all right so extending that logic why is it that rbi is focused more on let's say consumer price index vis-a-vis wholesale price index so the consumer price index is what affects the public directly sir uh, the wholesale price index does not reflect uh, what the masses face in the markets daily sir so that is the reason we have shifted uh, to a consumer price index about a decade ago sir all right thank you very much sir mustafa to one last question before we let you go 
imagine a situation where you are working as a district magistrate of a district you are holding a meeting with your subordinate officer in which the medical officer of the district head of the medical uh, medicine is also hap- there he happens to be there so suddenly you find one of your subordinate officer falling sick probably as because you are a doctor you could sense that the f- fellow has suffered a heart attack then what will be your reaction as a district magistrate of uh, a district so me becoming a dm does not mean me unbecoming a doctor so my medical instincts will kick in immediately sir and uh, the first aid that i have learned to check the circulation airway breathing disability i'll get down to my medical basics and uh, try to see if the individual requires a cpr at the spot sir but you uh, don't forget your C- cmo is also there chief medical officer is also sitting in the meeting who is supposed to be taking care of uh, your uh, health system so will you uh, jump into his shoes sir uh, cpr cardio pulmonary resuscitation is a process that requires more than one individual sir so i believe both the cmo and a former and a doctor so you will go by the advice by. of the cmo or you will have your own opinion because you are a superior authority there cmo doesn't uh, he cannot uh, resist your advice or your dictat so to say so the cmo being actively in the field i'd give his view precedence over mine sir okay thank you very much your interview is over you be good thank you sir thank you ma'am my comments sir yes come in sit mustafa thank you sir so how was your experience mustafa sir uh, i had a pleasant experience sir i believe there were some nerve wracking questions uh, that made me also think about my own uh, basics sir so, why should you call it pathetic a uh, nerve wracking sir this is your uh, uh, first attempt at the interview yes sir first at the interview sir you are not qualified before no sir and which attempt is this this is the fourth attempt sir fourth attempt so what happened in earlier uh, attempts the first two attempts i gave during my masters in surgery sir and uh, they were dummy attempts if i can be honest about it the third one i gave right after my exams uh, i qualified the prelims but couldn't qualify the mains sir this time i have come to the state sir so how have you done your written paper sir i'm confident about them i have worked on the areas i was deficient last time i was not able to complete my papers themselves because i think i'm a slow writer sir Uh, so this time i have both worked on my speed and content sir mustafa your interview has gone very well in one word uh, we should call it excellent you are a wonderful candidate for the civil services you have all sterling qualities of head and heart so that we could see so you are an honest person a man of integrity you could uh, deal in various subjects and very deftly and uh, social traits also as excellent i must say so all qualities of a civil servant are there with you very ethical honesty of purpose your interactive skills your communication skills everything is absolute par excellence i must say one or two things you have to slightly curb just by way of uh, advice the very first question when i asked you to introduce yourself highlighting your educational background and professionals one two things i'd asked you mind the words you should have stopped there then you brought in your siblings your parents were not required unless or until you are asked just stop there only you have to be a patient listener also listen to what a member is asking you and try to be very precise in your answer that is good always so that is one area of concern that uh, in your eagerness to engage members probably at times go overboard that should not happen otherwise a very interesting person to talk to so everybody will like to talk to you isn't it and very uh, you have look very young very child like appearance is there okay so these are good qualities i must say these are very good qualities <clears throat> that has to be curbed so be specific to the point whatever is asked to you and and be your natural self it's not that i'm wanting to curb your natural tendencies and all that be your natural self but at the same time be smart enough to understand what is expected of you from the other side 
unless until you are provoked and all that. We tried to provoke you also on certain things, but you maintained your cool and you gave a very balanced view. Like uh, film and all that, your views were excellent, very balanced. The, the question was asked just to provoke you, but you did not get provoked. That, that, that's the best part in you. Otherwise, to... So, may I add something? Sure, sure. Sorry, sure. sorry uh -huh. sir. Uh, when you were introducing your mother, there was a badge of honor when you narrated about her educational qualification and then there was a dud. You said, but she's a housewife. The language should be, and she's a housewife. And being a housewife, I, a housewife, I believe, is much more challenging than a civil servant. So the word but can be outrightly offensive. So it's and and not yes, but. Yes, sir. I'll make note of that, sir. Otherwise, uh, excellent. God willing, uh, you should uh, be in top 100. Let's see. Our blessings to you and uh, seek blessings from the Almighty. Anything which you want to ask from us, you are free to ask. Yes, sir. I had a few questions, sir. Uh, one, I was, uh, I have a tendency to over speak at times, sir. So my answers were they long? I, I told you we are the very odd set. Yes, sir. The messages are very loud and clear. Yes, sir. Speak what is required of you, because you have that natural tendency to speak a lot. This is good, otherwise. But in a formal environment like this, it's better to restrain yourself and restrict your. Uh, that you should not be restricting your natural uh, flair. Flair has to be there, but it has to be in flow. You should not be overboard, as I said. So over speaking at times uh, is not good, isn't it? Otherwise, good. Otherwise, good. So many questions were asked on medical. Probably those, so many questions uh, may not be asked on medical, but larger issues. Look at the issue or, or a larger canvas, then. Questions on related to COVID will definitely be asked. You have been declared a COVID warrior. Most of the doctors have been. So what were your experience as a COVID warrior? What are the shortcomings, deficiencies you could notice in the system which you would like to improve? All those questions you should keep somewhere behind the back of your mind. Those questions may be asked. Like one question was asked, Ivermectin and all that. And the answer was all right. The answer was all right because ivermectin was prescribed by all the state governments. Sir, I have one question, sir, that I'm struggling to uh, fix myself on, which is why do you want to become a civil servant after being a surgeon, sir? Uh, did the answer that I gave today, uh, did it satisfy officers? Sir? Do you have any better answer <laughs> to this? I have Every other answers, once, you, you see, there, there are two sides of it. One is that you have toiled so hard to become a surgeon. You worked, studied so hard to acquire a higher degree. Having acquired a higher degree, becoming a, no, you are a specialist, not an MBBS doctor. You are a specialist. After rising so high in your profession and career, suddenly you are taking a U-turn. So, why? This question will be asked. Why? Answer is only one. Again, broader canvas, helping the society. You have seen uh, uh, sufferings of uh, patient from very close quarters. So it's not only restricted to health. So many other related issues are there. So you, you have a passion, a genuine desire to help the country, particularly the poor section of the country. Uh, in a very convincing manner, you have to say, out of that desire only, even at the, at the cost of your professional ethics, you have decided to join a service so that you get a better platform to serve the society. That is the only answer. There, is, uh, there couldn't be any, any other answer. If you have any better answer in your mind, you can share with us. Try and make sure that you're not prolonging this ha. aspect. Lesser it is discussed, more in your favor. Okay. And what else? Anything else? Ayushman Bharat scheme, please. I'll look her. into it once again. Yeah. And I asked you five shortcoming areas. Like you said, that was the answer I felt you were going, All like explaining place. one point. I have to cut you again and again. So as sir has already said, listen to the question. Na? And be specific, be succinct, specific yeah. succinct answer. Let the exam <laughs> board because member is, ask the it, next question. It is question. not a debate, it is an interaction. It is not also a questioning, it is not a cross-examination from our side. Don't, don't be 100% convinced that in the real interview-like uh, situation, it is not going to be cross-examination. We may be cross-examining you in various mock interviews, but when you go for the real interview, 
it is a pure and simple interaction because it is a test of your personality, not the test of your knowledge. Knowledge has already been tested through various other exams. It is your personality, how you react under various situations, how you react under pressure, what are your traits, how do you think, how do you convey your ideas, how do you communicate. These are things and this is what is going to give you very good marks. If you are able to communicate, if you are able to show a positive bent of mind, if you are able to understand the socio-economic problems of the country or what is happening around the country or around the world, if you are keeping yourself abreast with that, that's it. That is why I said, Ki, don't go overboard, isn't it? Because this side of people are more knowledgeable than you. They have gone through this grill. You are still very young. So at, at times you appear to be slightly pedantic, if I so say. So don't try to be a pedantic, isn't it? Otherwise, absolutely have got all the ingredients of a very successful civil servant. I must tell you, just curb those uh, instincts and you will score very good marks. Convinced? All yes, the best. No, all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay.